Okay, there you go. You should be good. Thank you. So welcome. This is a conversation of majors biology. And um, right now we have two faculty participating and I anticipate more people will join us. People have been kind of popping in, floating in and out. And I, um, I was hoping that today we could use a method called lean facilitation. And generally it works better with a couple different people. Um, like it, you need a couple more people to do it. And so rather than starting with my original plan, I would like to maybe start, and Alyssa and I have had very successful sessions with just a few faculty in them uh, that you can go deeper and have a more authentic conversation. So I guess I'm wondering if, Lisa, if I could ask you to start and if you could just kind of give us a check in with where are you at right now? I know you and I talked a little bit before we started about fall is coming. It's not winter is coming, fall is coming. Right. But do you want to say a few words about where you're at right now? Well, I'm not quite sure where I'm at, but um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking about the, I teach the majors biology in the fall, which is um, 221 Ecology Evolution University. Um, I don't know yet if we're doing labs in person or if they will be fully online. I kind of want to be uh, prepared for both really um, and maybe start face-to-face -face and then switch to online or, or something. But you know, I, I know I need to be flexible. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't done very much yet for, um, to try to find um, online versions of, uh, of labs for the topics that I want to do. But that's sort of Kind of the, the work I'll be doing next. Uh, I also teach environmental science and, and I will be teaching that uh, summer quarter as well as fall. So um, I've been doing that online for years anyway. It does have a lab. There are a couple of labs that I probably will be changing. So that's on my mind also. Um, I, just, I just got on the, uh, the Canvas shelf for the environmental science group and there's definitely overlap in the ecology part of both the majors biology and environmental science. So mm. was just this morning looking at a few things that, that might be useful for, for one or the other. Thank you so much. And I guess I was just thinking too, like perhaps we could use this information and conversation to kind of set potentials for the future of the work. Mm -hmm. um, because again, I think when you're looking for online versions for the topics of the labs you're teaching, you know, that, that I think if you know what those topics are and other people are like, oh yes, those are also topics, you know, if there's mm -hmm. a way we could sort of work together so that mm -hmm. you don't have to do it all by yourself. Sure. Um, that is very helpful. Thank you. And also thanks for just thinking about the cross section between <laughs> environmental science and biology and that Venn diagram center of ecology. Because again, I would love to see a little more cross pollination over the COPs as well. Um, I think that will be very helpful for us moving forward beyond COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And Robert? Um, I'm anticipating we're gonna be fully online for a long time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I teach zoology. And uh, so we have it as 212 at our campus. I'm, I'm at Pierce College down in Lakewood okay. and um, south of Tacoma. And um, I taught it asynchronous. And um, so my mindset has been that because I'm a community college instructor, the courses that I teach are basically the prerequisite courses for the upper levels. And <clears throat> the real focus to me for the one and 200 level courses are the vocabulary first mm. and the concepts kind of big picture viewings of the concepts and then going from you know kind of like an, an image of earth down to in fact i use that kind of that emergent properties idea um looking at a planet from space or looking at an atom on the planet mm. of an element so um i i think i'm doing all right, my students' grades are, are good. Um, they're, in fact, I haven't compared them, <clears throat> excuse me, to last year yet. Um, we use Tableau, and so we can look at our, um, 
grade distributions in our courses and we can track them quarter to quarter based on certain demographics, students of color, students who at a certain level of um, finance poverty or students who are first, first students to go to college, stuff like that. So I can do breakouts in my courses. And so I'm really curious at the end of this quarter to, to look at my grade distributions in Tableau for this course versus last year and the years before to see did the grades go up? Are the grades even? And I think they're about the same that they've been the last couple of years. I, I use a lot of online ancillary work already in my courses and I've been teaching online for about 20 years now. So, so to do this is not really that big a deal for me. My biggest challenge is, is trying to, to think about the critical thinking pieces. What, what do I want them to walk away from at the end of the quarter with? Um, so number one, it's vocabulary understanding. So I do a lot of etymology, breakdown, root words. What does this mean? How to pronounce that, stuff like that. And then like ecology, you know, a big picture image of it and then go down to the smaller, like I teach a, an environmental course too. And uh, one of the labs that I do, I just graded it last week is I have them assess their water use at their residence. <clears throat> I have them do both potable water. And um, as part of that, I have them uh, ask questions to you buy bottled water. If you do, how much does it cost? Where does it come from? Um, where's the water source from? Are you a member of a part of a watershed? Do you have a well? Are you part of a city system? How's the water treated? How's it regulated? What's in the water? Do you have fluoride in your water? So you have to do all this research and it's a pretty, it's a busy lab. I have them so they have a week to work on it. <clears throat> and then if I get a really good outcome from it, um, they'll spend about three hours researching it. And then, and, and so the second part of the lab is their wastewater. So do you have a septic tank? How old is the septic tank? How much does it cost to clean it? How often do you clean it? How does it work? What's it do? It's a drainage field. Um, or if you use uh, sewage, you know, where does your water go? How does it get there? How does your wastewater get there? How is it treated? What facility does it go to? How many stages does it have? Where does it go when they're done with it? What happens to the sludge? So they have to do a bunch of research and it winds up being a pretty good piece. Um, so that's how, that's how I try to do these, some of the labs that I do. Um, so it incorporates a vocabulary and it incorporates the concepts. And I try to get them to do a lot of writing in my courses because I find a lot of science students don't write. There's just so much material to learn. And I know personally by how I learn that I learn best by writing and integrating the material. So I'll have them, I'll have worksheets or PowerPoints or outlines of the chapter or um, I make up a glossary worksheet and I'll highlight all the major words. Like in my non-majors courses, I make glossary worksheets and I'll highlight the main words or I'll, I'll make worksheets where they have to put words, they have to write the words down and then I kind of emulate that with the assessments on Canvas. So my, my big thing, that my big, not big thing, but my current challenge is for summer, my biology 160 course. So this will be the first time I've taught it fully online and I'm a little, <laughs> a little upset that uh, I had an idea to use some microscopes. We we're going to order some. They have some scopes through Carolina Biological that are thirty dollars, and they're little monocular um, compound-like microscopes. They have, I think, they have three objectives, and they have an LED top light and lower light, so that you can also use it as a, in essence, a dissecting scope, like a field dissecting scope. But by the time I got the okay from our dean to order them and how we were gonna get them to the kids and whether we we're gonna have them keep them and use the lab fees to pay for them or have them return them to us so we can reuse them. By the time we had all of that figured out, which just, it was like dragging, <clears throat> dragging a big weight behind you, um, they had sold out of them. <laughs> so now I'm screwed, I gotta, I had <laughs> all these great ideas for labs that they could do <clears throat> basically backyard hey, labs. 
Yeah, thank you so much. This is this is awesome. And I just want to say really quickly that Karina Vega Vela has joined us. And so I just wanted to stop for a moment and just welcome her. Uh, Karina, hello. Thank and, you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> and right now we're just doing uh, check-ins um, because we didn't have enough people to do the activity I wanted to do yet. Yet. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, um, so Robert has just been, both Robert and Lisa have just kind of been sharing where their thinking is right now, like just what they're kind of thinking about. And I guess I was just hoping that possibly, would you mind just giving us a check-in about where you're at right now, what you're thinking about? And it can be work-related, it can be personal, it can be anything you want. Um, and then if we, and then after that, if we want to move to this uh, this activity so we can generate some topics for discussion. Sure. Um, hello, everybody. I teach at Wenatchee Valley College. Um, I am a program director for Mathematics, Engineering, and Science Achievement Program. So that is my full-time job. And then I also teach whenever they don't have enough people. So I use a lot of my um, knowledge from directing the program who serves the students who are going to transfer to four-year institutions um, in a STEM who are um, underrepresented groups as defined by NSF uh, to create my classes and to make changes as needed. I have been teaching since 2015 here at WBC, but I've taught since 2009 in different places. Um, I think one of the things that has uh, been most evident to me is uh, my expectations for the kind of support that students need when we are in a community college. I taught before a, at, at the graduate student level and in four-year universities, and um, I haven't changed my academic standards and expectations, but I have had um, uh, created a lot more support here in community colleges. Uh, I'm teaching right now 211 and I'll be teaching it in the summer as well. And um, um, we learn a lot from the first uh, time that we run it online. Our initial idea was to do a, um, a long term project in the lab and that had to be quickly scratched. And uh, now we're doing online labs. And we had done a lot of um, surveys with our class, um, well, not a lot, two, one at week three and another one at week five, uh, simply to hear back from our students and see what do they need, how do they best learn? And then we adapt to those um, needs. And so, um, so, Right now, uh, all of the students have found their rhythm. So the first five weeks were, were very intense in creating that support, giving them extensions on labs, no questions asked, um, giving them extensions in, in stuff until they figure out their rhythm. And now I, I don't have any more of those requests because they felt supported at the beginning and now it's everything, they figure it out, right? None of us knew how to do this whole pandemic thing. Um, so um, we're good. Now they are, uh, they have a lab. No, they have a final that is gonna be optional. Uh, we're doing contract grading. So if they, if they submit it and they are good, uh, they, they all have a grade up from their current grade. And um, it's been quite a learning experience. I taught online before and um, I did it alone and I didn't like it because I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, so it was really helpful to do it with someone who has taught online, who mm -hmm. has created hybrids, who has experience with curriculum development and it's definitely made a difference because uh, you can't literally take what you do in the classroom and put it online. You have to create stuff um, from scratch. And so I was fortunate enough that we were already assigned to teach together. Mm. And so we continue with that uh, model for this quarter. Uh, in the summer, I'll be teaching by myself. So um, it, it was really, um, I was really fortunate to have that experience to learn. So yeah. now that we've run it one time, um, I, uh, I've identified the things that still need more tweaking. And so, um, 
I have I have contacted the lab, um, the, the the group making the labs to see if they can match our lab fees, and they are willing to work with us so that uh, our students are paying the same that they would pay if they were face to face. But that that took so that kind of that's kind of like the kind of support that I wouldn't have thought about had I not been involved with Mesa. So right. I think that's that's what I have. Um, for this now. is this is super helpful, and I guess if I could ask one clarifying question, um, the labs. What were you so like? Just could you just clarify that for just one minute? Like, were you guys like using Labster or like? No, we used yeah. um, Lab Connect from Macron Hill, okay. and I asked my students um, in both of our surveys how they were working, and they liked it. Uh, it it's pretty good. Um, it's pretty good uh, teaching them. So, so what I created was a pre-lab assessment, the labs themselves, where they actually get to manipulate online, and then a post-lab assessment to see how much how much help they got out of the lab. Mm. And so, it has. I have not received any negative feedback about the labs not being useful or not helping them connect what they were learning. Um, online in the lecture. Uh, there were some comments about, I was skeptical about how this would work online, but after doing the, like a couple of them, I see that it is helping. So that's why I'm sticking with it for next quarter, uh, negotiating uh, to make sure we get a, a price that can work for our students. Thank you so much. This is Awesome. And I took detailed notes in the chat, uh, mostly for myself because I, this is great. Thank you so much. So I guess um, I'm wondering, so we could just continue to just have a conversation with the three of us, you know, um, and Alyssa, uh, with the four of us, like five of us, <laughs> I can do math. Um, or we could try out this lean copy idea uh, just to see how that works. Uh, so what what would you prefer? Would you would you like to just ask each other questions and build off of each other? Um, I was kind of just stalking. <laughs> I don't want to work. Don't make me come here and work. <laughs> no, I, trust me. I'm no, no, no. I'm not putting a, upon you. Um, I was teasing. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. It's all cool. Um, I just. Uh, I don't know, I just wanted to kind of sit in the background and kind of just hear what y'all were um, going to do or talk about. I just dropped in today because I, I just finished a therapy session with my therapist and, and then the email, email bell went off and I was like, oh, yeah, well, maybe I'll check into there because I'm online already. So, so here I am. <laughs> I'm so glad. And maybe one question I have is, so I know that Robert and Lisa both teach environmental science and the aspect of majors biology <clears throat> with more like plants, animals, zoology, plants and zoology. I, I guess it's animals, plant, right? Um, yeah. And so uh, I'm looking through, Karina, what, what course did you say that yeah. you are teaching? To, to, to 11? To 11. Okay, which one is that one? Major cell. Yeah. <laughs> I think I I, con I get the names confused. Yeah, it's major cell biology. So the focus is on cell biology. Cell, yes. Cell respiration, photosynthesis, cells, and then molecular biology and applications of molecular biology, like DNA mm -hmm. replication and CRISPR and stuff. What questions would you like to ask each other based on what you've heard from each other? Um. I, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't really have questions more that, like I said, you know, I, was, I was serious. I was kind of like, just wanting to, I'm, I'm kind of the person that looks for catalysts, right? So, something that clicks something in my brain and goes, Hey, I didn't thought of that before. That's kind of cool. And then I kind of go from there. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm that kind of a person. Um, so that's why, that's why I said earlier, I was just kind of, just going to stop kind of listen in the background and say, oh, that's, I hadn't thought of that. That's a cool idea. Um, I don't know. When I first started teaching, I was stressed out all the time. I, I don't, I'm not stressed anymore. 
years. <laughs> like I've done this too long. I think I've been, this will be like my 34th or year or some crap this fall. It's been a long time. Um, I just like to listen to what other people do. You know, it reinforces what I do to know that others are of a similar mindset, you know, with similar challenges and, and I've come up with really great ideas on how to do something. I really like the creative part of this. I mean, this is really pushing my creativity bubble and I'm loving that, loving it. I'm gonna write that down, really pushing my creativity bell. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. So yeah. one thing I, I did wanna say, like with the microscopes, I know that um, Katrina Fuller at Lower Columbia uses fold scopes. So okay. I think, oh, I was just gonna say, there's a lot of stuff in the 160 shell about fold scopes, if that would be useful or not. I, I, I've seen one of those and um, you can't really, well, the whole point of me wanting to get the monocular $30 field scopes was that they emulated a scope. The fold scope doesn't, it doesn't work for me. Mm. It's just, it doesn't, I mean, it's not an emulation. So if they, if they, if they have the fold scope, like I would use that in like in a non-majors course, but not for 160 or the 200s because, um, so if we're doing this online and we don't, you know, probably a year we're going to do this, right? Until there's, if we get a vaccine for a virus that has 18 to 20 to 40 different mutated forms of it already. Um, I don't know how that's going to happen. But um, so if we ever do get back on campus and uh, they've been using the fold scope, then you have to teach them how to use a compound light microscope, right? Because what they've been using is not really a scope. It's like... Um, it's like if I had a kid right now and all of the driver's ed places were closed. And so I got my PlayStation out and I taught her how to drive a car on Gran Turismo or something. Right. Yeah, but, and then, and then the, the facilities open and say, well, she's really good at driving a Lamborghini Countach right now. And she can corner and drifts and all of this stuff. And then she gets in an actual car. It's not the same. So the fold scope to me just, it's not the same. So I'd rather emulate, I'd rather, I have to figure out how to emulate scope work in such a way that when we do get on campus, like I have a couple of worksheets written up that describe the parts of the scope and there's the anatomy of the scope and what is the, what's the difference between a coarse and a fine adjustment? What's the difference between a high power and low power objective and all that stuff. But so the fold scope just didn't work for me, which is why I was really excited about this little Carolina biological duo scope because we ordered one, we got one and my peer, so I'm, I'm, I'm up here in Seattle. I, I'm not on campus right now. Um, she got it and she wrote this very enthusiastic email back to my um, lab technician and, and I that she just loved it. She said she went out in her garden and she grabbed a leaf and she could see the stoma with it she could um she could see um onion nuclei with it she uh she did a cheek scrape and she could see the nucleus of her epithelial cells with it i mean it's an actual legit little compound like microscope so i don't want to use the fold scope so i'm trying to think of something else now and evidently they you can acquire it through walmart or amazon but the price is a bit higher and i know some of my students I know a lot of people <laughs> who don't have funds right now. So that's not something I'm going to put on them. One and two, I just despise everything about Walmart. So I'm not going to have them use Walmart or Amazon as a, as a retail source. I, I think they're both evil, horrible corporations and I don't want to support them financially. So, um, so that's my, my, my bet right now. I'm just trying to figure out the scope part for 160. And I want to, I don't want to do it half-assed. I want to do it legit. And um, so I'm really bummed that I don't have access to these little scopes now. I think that would have just been, that would have been the game changer. Because you could do a lot, I could do several microscopy scope labs with that. Um, the what other bit, you're going to do 211. Yeah. Um, Karina, ahead, you're, gonna, you're teaching 211, you said? So I had an idea for a lab for 211 using a sourdough culture. Mm hmm because sourdough is like the big thing right now. Everyone's into sourdough. And then I found on, there was on um, 
think it was on Colbert, that there's a woman who's doing research out of, I think it's North Carolina, and she's having people send her data. So it's like citizen scientist work, where if you start a sourdough culture in your house, I think you're supposed to write down the data, like what kind of flour you're using, um, whether you're using filtered water or tap water, whether you set it on a counter in a corner in the dark or whatever, you write all this data down. Then you write down the first day you see the bubbles, how often you feed it and all of that. And then you send that information into this, um, this uh, woman who's collecting all of this data. And so they're trying to determine how these different communities, because we can't look at the actual community distribution in the sourdough. But anyway, it's kind of a citizen scientist. And so you can connect that with your cell respiration and your mm -hmm. fermentation lab. So you could have an online. So I was going to have my students start it on the very first day of class. I'm going to have them start the sourdough. I'm going to do it in my 160 course. And then as the week progresses, maybe I'll have them post in discussion boards images of it using their smartphone or um, maybe they could share their data, what kind of flower they use, where their water came from and all that. So it's really a minimal cost lab. Yeah. I, I did have some labs that were not that good with the virtual labs that I was using with Lab Connect. So um, I think I used some of the resources from Biology 160 to for the self-respiration one. It was still um, a simulated lab that they had to watch. So I am curious about um, labs that they could do at home. So uh, that sounds like a cool um, self-respiration lab. And right now, like right now, I still have to develop, um, my last lab was gonna be about um, herd immunity. And the, the, the virtual labs have some, uh, some um, uh, graphs that you can use to understand um, the r no for measles and flu and like they're very specific about what is happening right now, but that's it. So it just has the graphs that you can play with. And I haven't developed a lab yet. Like I, I would have to figure out what I'm gonna do with that um, so that it's meaningful to what they are, what we're all experiencing right now. So um, I'll, yeah, I'm still interested in developing more hands-on. Um, and I will probably for the summer do a combination of simulated and hands-on because there's only so much that I can do that I can ask them to do, right? Like, like Robert had said, um, there are some like some um, material materials that you just won't get. And I'll be using a combination of virtual labs and hands-on that they can uh, work on in their house. I guess I'm just wondering, is there a way like is there a way to for us to use this COP to develop collaboratively? You know how you were saying, yeah, yeah. Like, like I guess I was just wondering, like Robert, if you have kind of a fleshed out vision for it and you were willing to share it so that Karina could modify it and adapt it for her context. And then Karina, you could work on the graph on the the one that you were describing. My notes are sketchy for this, but the graphs to understand the flu that can really contextualize. And then if you shared that, then Robert could adapt that. And so I guess I'm I'm just wondering, like, is there a way for us to use our biweekly meetings to kind of check in with each other and be like, oh hey, I did it. <laughs> Here it is. And then we could kind of even peer review it. Um, yeah. That would be the stuff I have is just, it's in my head right now. It's just like, it's notes on my phone. It's just ideas that kind of pop into my brain and I write it down real quick so I don't forget it. Or at two in the morning, if I'm watching something on YouTube, it's like, oh, that's a good idea. I could maybe incorporate that as a link or something. But I haven't, I haven't really de designed anything for 160 yet because I'm, I'm trying to finish this quarter. Right, right. Well, yeah. we will be meeting bi-weekly over the summer. And so, you know, like maybe we could say, you know, like obviously at two weeks might be too close, but like if you, like what would happen if you were able to just get something down, to even a sketch that we could all look at next, our next meeting? That might be too soon. Yeah, I'm just, I'm honest to God buried right now. I, uh, <laughs> My English I teacher, would you, could you have a rough draft? <laughs> I had 120 essays come in Sunday. Oh my. 
because I sign a lot of writing in my classes and I have, I have seven courses I'm teaching right now. Oh my. So I'm kind of wow. busy. Yeah. <laughs> Just a smidge. Just a wee bit. I did want to say uh, Stephanie Hoffman has joined us and I just wanted to welcome you, Stephanie. And everybody kind of started with a little bit of a check-in. And again, like we're all kind of just using that to spin off from ideas. And so I just wondered if you wanted to say hi and how you're doing and. I'm so burned out. <laughs> so my last test um, for 213, um, well, the last two tests, I've been so behind that I actually just, for the multiple choice half, used the textbook questions. And the first time, it was fine. This past test, the average is a 90%. And some students finished the 20-something questions in 13 minutes. So I know that something fishy happened. So I'm just at, you know, I'm just at that point in the quarter. <laughs> um, but I did actually, I jumped in um, right at the point where you were talking about the sourdough thing. And I actually have that written down um, myself. Um, I think actually, I think I have a friend who like has actually met that woman or one of the people involved in that project. And so, um, and I'm teaching 211 in the fall as well. And so I was also thinking maybe I could try and flesh something out with that. So I'm definitely interested in like, at some point trying to develop that. Um, but along that line, uh, we got our, we ordered um, a bunch of the paper fold scopes that have occasionally been brought up. Um, and our techs were really nice and mailed them to our homes if we wanted. And so I have mine and I've assembled it and I played with it for about five minutes. And it's enough that I think for 211, I'm gonna have a quarter long project where they keep a journal and every week they have to look at something and talk about it and how does it connect to what we're doing in class. Um, and so I think this is something that potentially with the sourdough could also be tied in for a way to make them like look at it in some way. I don't know, I guess I might have to teach them how to do a serial dilution or something, but um, it, yeah, so I'm I'm on I'm on board for showing up with rough drafts at some point, just not until after this quarter is done. Yes, just not right away, just not tomorrow. Yeah. The other thing I'm just wondering is, you know, like I know the sourdough idea has popped up in the microbiology COP. It's popped up in a lot of different like I guess I was also wondering what would happen if a bunch of us all did some variation of the sourdough project and then we could all kind of be checking in with each other about like hey here's how it's going or this happened what do i do you know like if there's some there could be something interesting about a lot of people teaching it at the same time across the system yeah and then the other thing is um i had also thought about having students make their own yogurt just because that's a little more instant gratification than sourdough um and then it gives them flexibility because with sourdough, you, you can play with flour the same with, with yogurt. So you can play with what kind of starter are you using? Um, what kind of dairy product or not are you using? Because there are some that try to achieve something similar um, with a non-dairy option. And so was it? And then that's a faster kind of start to finish process for the student. Yeah. I'm also it actually sounds fun. I know. <laughs> I want to do it. I guess I was also thinking of my, the days I was a vegan uh, for about, a, for a couple of years. And I remember trying to make my own homemade vegan yogurt. And I got really frustrated because I wanted it to be perfect and done right. But as a scientist, you know, you're like, oh, it doesn't matter if it's perfect. It matters if you're observing the data and watching what's happening and asking questions. And I, I guess it, it feels like more of a learning environment than a perfectionist environment because you wanna post something to your Instagram. Um, yeah, the only downside is that the yogurt requires a little bit more on the student's equipment side because they have to keep it warm, um, mm -hmm. whereas sourdough can be done cold or at room temperature, so. Uh, how do you make the uh, yogurt? So yogurt, so, the reason I thought of it was I actually was making homemade yogurt for a while when I was an adjunct. Um, you basically, like the base recipes that were working for me were like your milk, 
and you basically scald it, bring it back down to like a incubating temperature, and then you add plain yogurt or whatever your starter is. So you can buy powdered starters as well. Um, and so then, right, you could have them play with what happens if they go buy a fancier yogurt or a flavored yogurt. But generally you don't add the sweetener during that step either. Um, you only sweeten at the very end after it's already fermented. Um, and so then you just let it go I was doing, I think, 10 hours of fermentation, and then it's done. Like, it, you just, it's already thickened. Um, if you wanted more of like a Greek approach, then you strained it, and that was, then you were done. If you wanted to stir anything in at that point is when you did it, so. So it would be, it would be something they could do, right, like a, a week-long, like, repeated approach and get to do replicates um, and see how it turned out pretty quickly. Um, whereas sourdough, you have such a long lead in until you can actually really use it. Um, but it does require you to be able to keep something at a relatively stable temperature. I was cheating and using an Instapot that had a yogurt setting on it. Um, but I've seen people online talking about using like crock pots as water baths or ovens with lights on and other arrangements of trying to maintain kind of a gentle warm temperature, so. Um, I, I, I make my own yogurt. I only have, and I only put the, the little culture in and I don't take care of it at all. Like I've forgotten it for like weeks and nothing, and like it still comes out. So that, that's why I was curious because I do not take care of my culture like zero. Yeah, no, I, oh, actually, I'm, I'm, I can, I, I don't know, I, I can share that culture with people because it grows and then it reproduces and that's how you have more. Yeah, because I would just save some of my previous batch and use that to start my next batch. Um, but yeah, no, that would be. I think what be... I'm making is kefir yogurt. Oh. I, I don't know. I, I have the little culture guys, the bacteria. Uh-huh. Yeah. So is that at a warm temperature or can you do that at room? I just live in my kitchen and forget about it for three days. And then I'm like, oh, I want a yogurt drink. And then I'm, it's done. So I, I literally do not even remember for weeks that I have it. So uh, right now it's in the freezer because I was forgetting it for so long. So, but, um, it, you, so I can use it every three days, I think, when I when I'm really into this, I want to drink yogurt thing. It's every three days. All I do is put the culture, leave it on my kitchen. And three days later, I come and check on it. And depending on how thick you want it, mm -hmm. the first day is going to be pretty runny. But by the third day, it's, it's pretty thick that I can make something with it. That sounds better than yeah. what I was doing. <laughs> so yeah, I can, um, I can unfreeze them and try to run some experiments and see if they are usable and they grow really quick and I've been trying to get rid of them uh, so I put them I, I give them to my dogs like so so I have plenty of it to go yeah. anywhere where it, where it can be used yeah so I can what I can do is um and freeze them and do some like pay more attention to them and and take notes and see where they are at at what day and see if that is useful for any of you yeah, that would be really handy because then we could potentially like have a kit that that they pick up from campus um, that has like the dollar seventy five paper microscope plus like your your yogurt starter or kefir starter. So that yeah, no, that I'd I'd be really curious to see. All right, I'll I'll unfreeze it. <laughs> Finally, awesome. I find something to do with it. Like I feel so bad that I here you go, doggies. I. Because I don't, I don't, I offered it to my friends and none of them are into yogurt making. So I'm glad that they'll be used for something. That's awesome. May, I, a, may, oh, sorry, may I ask how you guys use the fold scopes? I just got it. So I'm still envisioning how I might use it. Are you, or are you talking about like how it actually functions? No, how, how would you use it? I, I just don't know how I, I I mean they're really inexpensive and I know some of my peers at the other campus we have two campus um, scenario they used it but they haven't really shared what they've used it in the class to do I don't know 
what they're doing with it. Yeah. How would you use it in 160 or 211? So I don't know that I've, I think <clears throat> 160 students can handle like figuring out how it works um, and like applying it in a meaningful way that helps them. Um, but for 211, I kind of expect more out of them. And so I, I feel comfortable expecting them to figure it out enough that it's like, so we, we had uh, last, this past year, um, in person, um, something that we called the field journal project. And so for the whole quarter, they had to pick their own things. And what we just gave them was a list of big topics out of the class, like cellular respiration, photosynthesis, um, cell division. And then they had to, in some way, like observe something, quantify it, describe it, link it to the topic. Um, and so I'm thinking I can, I can mimic that because they were, we gave them access to the lab room um, outside of class time to, to get that done. So if they wanted to use the microscope um, in lab, they could do that. And so instead, if they have the full scope at home, they can do something similar where maybe they decide to scoop some water out of a puddle and look at it. And um, then the next time they decide they want to take a leaf and shove it under here. Um, just kind of letting them explore a little um, and and be able to play with it in a in a way that you know they're doing it in a relatively low stakes way because it's you just try and you you can fail and you can try again um, even though this overall project is you know a significant portion of their final grade so just a way to make them kind of apply information outside of the confines of their normal assignments in a way that lets them apply some of their curiosity, I guess. What is the magnification of it? I think they say 140 X. Um, so it comes with a paper wedge that you fold. Um, and so I don't know, like I said, I spent about five minutes messing around with it and figured out like how to look through it, how to, uh, line my phone up with it and then how to project an image on a wall. Um, and so I don't, it's not great. So like they bought, they bought me the fancy version. <laughs> so I, I got some of their pre-made slides. Um, and so I have like a fern indusium slide, I think mounted on here. And it's enough that I can see the individual cell wall structures. I don't think it would work for very well for like something that you'd need oil for, but relatively large cell structures should be okay. Um, so that came with prepared slides? So they do have prepared slides on their um, website. Uh, I think our, I, I just asked our, our lab staff to um, buy a set so that we could try it out or anyone who wanted to could try it out. And they seem to have bought us I got two. I got one, I think that has the like accessory kit. So it has um, some actual glass slides, including a few that are pre-made. So the fern uh, and a locust antenna appear to be what I got. And then they also bought the $30 sucker, which comes in the fancy tin with tardigrades all over it um, that has actual preparation stuff in it. Um, and we're thinking that that might be worth it to ask the students to buy because it comes with like pipettes and little Eppendorf tubes that they could use. Um, and then also it comes with a set of slides. So let's look at that set. I haven't actually opened this set because I opened up the other one. Um, it looks like it might be the same. So a couple of blank slides and then they've taped this shut, but probably Pollen comparison and fern rhizome. So, but yeah, so the $30 kit, if it comes with a couple of slides, you could use that as like a lab assignment, maybe make them prove that they can use it and then set them loose on whatever they can encounter. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it was, um, I don't know how many of our faculty have decided to grab it, um, but I think it's kind of cool. So do you, do you think it's worth the investment? Like I said, I'm, I'm really concerned about finances for my students right now. Like I use, all the books I use are old books or OER books because 
they're they're dirt poor right now. So yeah. the thirty dollar kit. I don't know. I'm torn about the thirty dollar kit, the base kit, and then you know it'd be a lot cheaper for the school to buy a box of glass slides and hand those out instead. Um, and then like this quarter for 213, we asked students to go on Amazon and buy a basic dissection kit that was like 10 bucks. And I bet they could, you could find something similar that would be cheaper. It just doesn't come with the cool tin, which I mean, who needs the tin really? Yeah. So I think, the base kit, because that comes out to like a dollar seventy-five per um, scope per student, plus some sort of something else you can find might be a, a more affordable option. Um, I was thinking that way. The other, the other two eleven instructor at Green River um, is inclined to ask students to buy the thirty dollar version um, because we're also ex asking them to buy Campbell Biology which is an investment anyway. Um, so I don't know, we'll, we'll continue our negotiations and conversations over the summer um, about what we think is more appropriate. But I think you could easily piece together something comparable, but for cheaper. Do you think they'll use the scopes for future quarters? I have no idea. Um, I have not thought ahead to whether we're gonna be teaching potentially still online into winter quarter. Um, if we are the way Green River has been divvying, or at least for our biology department, we're trying to make sure that we're giving options that are listed in the different modalities, if we're allowed to. Um, and I've been the online person. Um, and so I guess potentially I could carry it on into 212, though we mostly did dissections. So, um, but then, you know, maybe it's the case of can we find some slides that they can assemble, you know, kits out of that we can mm -hmm. order in bulk? Or do we ask them to cut up grocery store items and look at them? I don't know. Um, so it'd be nice to, um, but we'll see. And I also don't know how well this holds up. It's supposed to be tough. Um, and it's sort of a plasticky feeling material, not just cardstock. So. Mm -hmm. Once I start playing it with it, we'll see if it can be something that they could use for like a whole year's worth of majors biology. Um, so, thank you. No, it's my new toy. Can I ask one clarifying question? Did you say that you had your students? This is way back. I'm just looking at my notes. Did you say that you did have your students buy a basic dissection kit? Yes. Okay. It was like we found one that was ten dollars that had more than what we thought they needed. Um, and so we felt comfortable. Obviously, we didn't list that one, but we were, if students were like, which one? We were like, there's a cheaper one. Go find the cheaper one. Right. So. Of course, I also have a student who owns her own entire microscope rig at home. So, <laughs> yep. So we have about eight minutes left, and I'm just wondering if folks have questions that they'd like to explore with each other or topics. I did have a, had a question about the sourdough starter. And when I teach environmental science online, I have them make bread dough with yeast. And it only just occurred to me that yeast has been in short supply of late. And I'm wondering if um, I use that so, so that they're, um, Simulating population growth, so they start, you know, they start the bread dough and then watch the the yeast or the the dough rise over a few hours, um, and then you know, hopefully, plot out something that looks like exponential growth. Um, does anybody have an idea if sourdough could do the same thing? I think it would just take a bit longer, but um, you could write it up that it's actual, actually a more realistic approach to exponential growth or logistic growth because as the as the community develops and it's kind of an emulation almost of human population mm -hmm. so you've got a diversity to the group and if the diversity of the group is supportive of the other members of the population then the outcome of of the bubbly group that you make 
I, yeah, it depends on how you write it up. That would be kind of fun, actually. Yeah, it's really fun. I haven't made sourdough in a long time, and I haven't made it from from scratch <clears throat> in, in memory, at least. So uh, I'll have to explore that. But it's definitely time for me to start thinking about that one. That's I a really good idea to use that as an uh, as an example of logistic and mm -hmm. exponential growth. That's a really cool idea that you have. Yeah, even with the with the bread dough, um, it tends to work. Like for three quarters of the students, they get something that looks more or less like logistic. Some of them, you know, their data is too too messy to to see much of a pattern, but but it works often enough that that I like to do it. I will say that I was able to buy like the one pound size of yeast still, <laughs> so could potentially still get around it by buying the quantity that a casual baker doesn't want and then distributing it. Yeah, yeah, we're making kits for them anyway. Yeah. yeah. Costco has a lot of them in Seattle, the big bricks. Yeah. Oh, I'll check it out. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it's just a lot of good ideas. It's just I need more time to think of it, mm. to think it all through. Yeah. I'm just trying to finish this quarter. <laughs> right. I did want to ask, um, so Bobby, Karina's colleague, is um, going to be the lead facilitator for all the biology COPs. Um, she's the one with the the that Karina team taught with, and she has the curriculum design background, and um, and especially leading with racial equity. And so, um, so we're going to be transferring. We're, and then Lisa is going to be one of the biology leads to kind of help us think about the future of the COP. But I guess I did want to ask, like, when you think about like meeting period every two weeks, what would you like to see happen at our next meeting? Or if we could even backwards design a little bit, what what, how could this group be useful to you? Especially thinking like the end of fall quarter 2020. <laughs> what, what do you wish we had, what would you like to see us have done by that moment? I'm pretty happy with how it has been going. I <laughs> kind of just need people to check in with and to throw some ideas around with. Yeah. I like, I like to use this like a writer's room, like a, if we're writing a sitcom or something, just about, you know, bouncing a bunch of crazy ideas off of each other's heads and go, that sounds crazy, but it could work. How could we make it work? So crazy. It just might work. Yeah, no. And that's, to me, that's the best part of all of this is how many people get to be creative again now because we're forced to do it. And then some of us really love that. Like curriculum design. I love curriculum design. You know, how do you get all of them engaged? It's fun. It's, you know, taxing and stressful, but it's fun too. But like I said earlier, that's why I dropped in today, just to kind of get some stalking background information as to what's going on. Did you have a catalyst moment? Um, yeah, I, I took a bunch of notes. Like with the sourdough, you could, you could incorporate, like... I have my, my starters are in the fridge. So you could start some in the fridge. You could start some on the counter. You could start them with different pHs. I, you'd have to figure a way to determine pH, but you, you could maybe try to start a sourdough culture with, instead of using water, using um, something acidic like vinegar or something basic. Um, so you could incorporate that into science, or, or not science, excuse me, like macromolecules. Like basically what's happening is you're converting starch into carbs and simple carbs so, yeah i'm just trying to think i mean the sourdough concept i mean just that was beautiful what you said lisa about the exponential growth idea i hadn't even thought of, about that as a population um experiment um observation there's a lot you could do with sourdough and i just keep fermentation in general but sourdough is like wow like i took the hooch out of my starter the other day the hooch is what the bakers call the fluid that separates at the top. And I put it in a vessel and I put it in a freezer to see if there was ethanol that I could see at the top because ethanol won't freeze. And I don't see any ethanol in the hooch that I had. So I'm going to try to make a larger um, starter mass 
to see if I can do that. And then I was writing down, well, then you could actually see ethanol production by getting um, a con not, not, not a conventional apple juice because it's got like fungicides in it, but um, an organic apple juice, like a frozen one, and then throwing starter yeast in it. And then um, you could get ethanol production off of that. Maybe there's a way you could trap the gases, like the idea that I would share with my students when we do the LOD experiment with um, phenol red in the lab. If there's a way to trap the gases coming off the oxygen, you could put a match into it, a lit match that, that would flare up. Or if you did, if you trap the gases off of your sourdough starter, most it would be a li little bit of carbon dioxide, but most of the carbon dioxide would become from ethanol. ethanol. So you could trap that gas and do a lit match and put it up into it and it would go out because you'd be trapping the CO2 because anyway, it's just all kinds of cool things you can do from home with that lab. And I'm just trying, I'm, I want it to be really affordable and it's just stuff that got kicking around the house already. That's kind of gee whiz science. That's the stuff that I love about science is that gee whiz part. Like, wow, I hadn't thought of that before. That's really cool. Um, I, like that. I don't know. Thank so anyway, you. that's why I came in. Thanks for offering this, John. No, it's beautiful. I love I love scientists, and I especially love biologists. I've discovered um, because it's just so fun to look, talk and learn. I'm just wondering, did anybody else have any catalyst moments? No worries if you didn't. Just wondering. Well, the sourdough, the use of sourdough for me, um, for the other purpose, I think was the one for me. And, and just the other thing I, I really appreciate about uh, about this, whatever this is, you know, the, the, the brainstorming in the meetings is great as long as there are enough people. And I know there are, you know, gobs of other biology teachers out there, but um, you need critical mass to, uh, to get the ideas flowing. And sometimes it only takes two, but sometimes, you know, two doesn't work. Um, but, yeah, doing the... Um, doing the promotion for it, I guess, is a good thing. But I, I also really, really love the canvas shell and sharing sharing, sharing artifacts through that. <laughs> artifacts is my favorite word right now. <laughs> yeah, like, I know, I get a lot of email from you. I, I did want to say also that this afternoon is the environmental science meeting at one o'clock. And there is a lot of crossover between environmental science and the majors biology as Lisa pointed out at the beginning of the call with, um, with the cell biology or the environmental cell. Environmental, okay, I have to go back and look at my notes. But I did want to say, um, if you can join us at one o'clock for the environmental science meeting, and if that's not on your Outlook calendar and you want to be invited, just shoot me a quick email and I'll forward it to you. Because um, again, it's, it's really interesting to think about the potential cross-pollination of the COPs in addition to this kind of ideation of like-minded people teaching the same courses. Yeah, and Alyssa and Karina are having a cool conversation in the chat. Yeah, I just wondered if there was a way to um, take some of the load off faculty by having an assignment where students could go and search for an experiment that would meet whatever the learning requirement was for the unit and then they could choose what they had the supplies to do or could modify and then they could share back with the class and then that might help the teachers um, collect some content maybe and then um, might help refine and um, give a bigger pool of possibilities for um, doing different activities. I just wondered if there, w there was a way to involve students in that learning process in addition to having them do some of the experiments and looking at slides and things. That could almost be a capstone project too. You know, <laughs> like they have to quantify like why this is a good lab based on what they've learned. And uh, Karina, I love your, your thing too about making sure students know how much time to spend on it. Yeah. Um, tilting. <laughs> I actually, I found a really cool, um, 
experiment that I've actually, I wrote it down because I want to go try it, but it's making a battery out of a lemon. It's like a little fire starter. I mean, that might be dangerous for students. I don't know, but I just was like, hey, that is like one of the coolest things I've ever seen. I want to do that experiment myself. So maybe um, there's a way to get students really excited about doing things if um, they can choose, um, you know, how they want to show what they've learned. Mm. For sure. Well, anything else for the good of the order before we go to our respective, back to our lives, back to the, back to the frenetic piece and also the deep sadness and grieving. It's been, yeah, it's been a very uh, hard time. You doing okay there, kiddo? I, uh, yeah, I, you know, like Karina is also part of some of these larger conversations with the, you know, around DEI during COVID-19. And so I think a lot of us were already feeling the weight of equity gaps that have been exacerbated. And then to see the pain of so many people, given what's happening right now, like with this string of racial violence against Black people made even more visible. Um, and just, I think, a lot of us have been just trying to figure out, you know, what's what's our role? Like, how are we complicit? And and so I think there's a lot of people just, it's a very sad time, but also a time of great, it feels urgency. It feels, yeah. I, I felt this way my whole life. I grew up in Detroit and I remember when Detroit burned in 1968. Wow. So this is, just another day for me. So I'm sorry that I, I see it's weighing heavy on you. That's why I asked. Yeah. Um, but it's it's endless. It's happened for 300 plus years. You know, it's just another day in the life of the hood. It's it sucks. Inequity is everywhere. I Where I live, I've got a bunch of people. Last night, they were all concerned that there were going to be people running down our street. <laughs> stealing lawn furniture and, and um they live in white bread america and i don't understand their their, their mentality i think they don't understand they never they didn't live in the kind of environment that i did right where to be shot at was normal or to 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 have be robbed is normal right or to be intimidated by the police was normal so it's kind of nice. I'm sad that this happened, of course, that, that Mr. Floyd was murdered because he was murdered. Um, but I'm also glad that people are starting to wake up that, that this is the norm and it should never be the norm. Um, and I'm sorry that, that some people are really kind of being bowled over by this. Um, uh, I really am, but don't, don't let it eat you alive because I, I have a, three lines, three mantra lines now that I've developed in the last couple months. And the first one is I have no control over this. Like our, our current administration, the head of our Senate, the head of our Department of Justice, I have no control over that. I can be really angry and upset and it could eat me alive, especially with all of us living in isolation quarantine mode, but don't let it do that to yourself become a citizen advocate and think of how I can, how can you personally make a difference? Maybe when you're at Costco and there's a person of color at the cashier, start a conversation up with them and say, hey, thank you for working here. I know this is a, a tough job and I really appreciate you being here. Because I, I had that conversation with a gentleman that I know through Costco is a really big African-American guy. And um. He shared with me that a lot of people that come to Costco are just rude. They're rude and they don't want to talk to him. And, uh, and he's a very engaging kind of guy. And he looks forward, he said, to certain customers that he has a relationship with because they help him get through the day. I think I if think we just acknowledge other people, that would make a huge difference. I, I absolutely, I, yes, I totally hear you. I think the biggest piece for me is like thinking about the work that Karina is doing to like close equity gaps and, and design 
so responsibly to her students and to really close those equity gaps. And I, I guess that's, that's more what I've been, that's what's been sort of sitting heavy with me is that I do feel like there's a big responsibility that I play at the state board, you know, to try to cultivate and support, you know, and, and spread work like Karina's so that more people are, and again, like work, like the conversation we had today about like, how do you make learning real for students and link it to social issues? And so I guess, um, I guess I've also been thinking a lot about the way that I have, like, like and, and sorry, this is a longer conversation that, and I'm, I'm, I guess too, just how do we honor and acknowledge what's happening in a way that, that, that holds space for people um, and, their, and their grief and their mourning and not make it just business as usual. Right. Yeah, just be human. Let them know that you're a real human and that you have true empathy for them. Like I said, if I see somebody, I, 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 I live in a fairly Caucasian environment. And when I moved here, I was in shell shock. This was not what I'm used to. I don't, I, there are not very many people of color where I live. And so when I get out into the real world where people of color are, I try to engage with them as much as I can. Um, so that they know that I recognize them as a, a fellow human. Because right now I think they don't think that way. Um, and I agree with you, the grief is huge right now. And um, yeah. I think if we just acknowledge them, like I said, any, anywhere you go, like just say, hey, just say hi to them, you know? Let them know that you, you share the same airspace with them and that, that, that you've got their back. I mean, just saying hi, let somebody know you've got their back. Yeah, and real community. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, I really appreciate all of you for holding that space for a moment. And I, I almost, I wish that I had began with thinking about this moment, you know, and what it means. Um, and so I think too, that was sort of my dilemma is, you know, like um, when, a, when a, a, one of the women that I was in meeting with this morning has a daughter who identifies as being of color. She's, she identifies as black and all of the white faculty had not mentioned a thing and it was just sort of business as usual. And she gently wrote to them and said, Hey, you know, are we going to acknowledge, you know, like, and again, I'm sure she, I don't know how she put it, but, and everybody ended up writing a letter to the students as a result of her action. And so I guess for me too, it's, it's also how do we frame our work differently based on what's happening. Um, mm -hmm. And it does feel heavy right now. Um, it's scary right now. For me, it's not heavy as much as it's scary. Yeah, it's scary. That's right. You're right. It's scary. Because we have too many lunatics with too many guns who have very small brains. Yeah. Yeah, and a long history of injustice. Yep. Yeah. Well, I do want to say thanks to all of you for this, and I hope I might see you tomorrow, tonight, to this after, wow, tomorrow, tonight, this afternoon, <laughs> one o'clock, <laughs> in, the, in the environmental science conversation, and I, I just really appreciate all of you today. Likewise, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Jen. I appreciate it. And I'll see you in a little bit. <gasps> Yay. Oh. Do you, you have the meeting info, right? I do. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. I'll good. see you in a little while too. All right. I'm stopping the recording. Okay. Bye all.